Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our virtual event, Gallery Conversations, uh, discussing the exhibition currently on view at Angels Gate Cultural Center. Uh, multiples. I see we still have a few people um, arriving, so hopefully um, we get everyone in here in the next minute or two. Uh, but thank you for signing up and for joining us on a Thursday evening. Uh, my name is Cecilia Coger. I am the Director of Exhibitions and Public Programming at Angels Gate Cultural Center. Uh, just so everyone's aware, this meeting is being uh, recorded. Uh, we use it for educational and promotional purposes after the event. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about Angels Gate Cultural Center. We are a nonprofit art organization based in San Pedro, California. Uh, we provide uh, artist studios, we provide artists who teach in local classrooms in the Los Angeles County area, uh, and we also put on public events and art exhibitions in our gallery space. And um, just as a recognition of our history and the grounds on which we are located, uh, we recognize that we live and work on the traditional and sacred lands of the Tongva, Kitsch, Achaman and Chumash and the many other indigenous groups who call these grounds home. We at Angels Gate Cultural Center honor and extend our gratitude to all of the original people still living in this region. I just think it's very important that we acknowledge that. Um, again, my name is Cecilia. Uh, we also have uh, B. Korea, which is also um, a staff here at Angel State Cultural Center. She is our Getty Morrow intern, and you'll be able to meet her at the end. She's helping out uh, in the background, so thank you, B. Thank you to all the artists and curators who made time this evening to speak more on their exhibition. And uh, one more acknowledgement, uh, we just want to thank the Pasadena Art Alliance and the Department of Cultural Affairs, City of Los Angeles who are sponsors of this exhibition and this event. So now I'm gonna pass it to the curators of Multiples. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Thank everybody for coming. Uh, so Nathan, Sam and I have organized this exhibition. Uh, it came out of conversations we were having probably about three years ago around our studio practices. And Think of this exhibition as an opportunity to kind of expand that dialogue. So we're very excited to, um, to get to talk to everybody tonight. Um, the way this is going to go is that I'm going to throw it to Nathan, a fellow organizer who's going to orient us with the exhibition as we move through the virtual model. And then we're going to be uh, breaking it down into uh, questions, artists asking each other questions. Um, we will be open to audience member questions at the end. Feel free to put your questions in the chat and then we can address them. So over to you, Nathan. Hey, well, actually, can we can we click out of this full screen? Absolutely. Real quick? Yeah. Um, and then back up, maybe back up one. Yeah. Um, as she's doing this, you'll be able to see um, that we uh, really tried to take into account the whole space. Um, I think every one of these artists in the show is interested in unconventional spaces. And so you'll see that Megan has taken up, perhaps to their chagrin, the, uh, the office uh, furniture as the first kind of first obvious work in the show. And this is as you come off the door into the exhibition space. So there's that, and then you come around. And we'll, we'll talk about Hannah's text, which is also hiding back uh, in, in a moment. Um, yeah, we can get to the view of the whole hallway. Right, and so, so what you have here is on the left, um, you have one of, Colleen's works, which is deployed as a functional bench because it because it is both a sculpture and a piece of furniture and, and exists in both of those worlds, as well as a water storage unit, which we will talk about later. And then on the right is my piece, which talks uh, directly to the office as well as decor and also in its repetition, in its unusualness, a piece of uh, artwork. And um, actually, while we're kind of here, you can kind of see a, 
a nice juxtaposition. I don't know, oh, my, my mouse is gonna do it. And you can see two of Noah's works. One is hiding up in the upper left corner here. There's the hand. Um, Noah's uh, very cool surprise hanging up there. And then his kind of on the other end of the spectrum, his sort of monumental work, his large handmade work, which hangs back there. But um, but let's also not pass by Sam's work here on the left, which sets up um, uh, some of Sam's practices. And this is uh, puzzle pieces he created by taking the sort of generically die cut puzzles and blending them into unusual and sort of a little bit subversive juxtapositions of their pictorial meaning. That's great, yeah. So he took, he took sort of these kind of quotidian objects and these um, uh, sort of standardized pieces realized that you could uh, merge them because the pieces were die cut the same and, and you get these great sort of uh, sort of overlaps. But we'll talk again, we'll talk about more of the pieces as we as we come back around. So let's let's press on. You got Katya's piece to the left. Oh yeah. Oh, and the, and another little hider. We, I, I like that we have a lot of these little moments in the show, um, offering little little resonances in terms of color, or um, you know, even just to set up the idea of the sort of multiple or accumulation. Katya's is a nice little a nice little um, amuse bouche here in the front to set that up. So yeah, this is uh, this is this is should I get in? Well, we'll, we'll talk. So I don't want to get 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 hung up. We're going to talk a lot about Katya's work. Katya's got a, a lot of stairs on the left here. You'll see. Well, why don't we hold here? Because on the left you'll see uh, the first of Katie's work, which is these deceptive photographs, and I won't I, I won't sort of get into it right now. But these are these are photographs. They're appearing to show the same scene, but the scale shift, what it does is it plays with the sort of tricks you can do in photography, um, using this sort of juxtaposition to, to um, make some things bigger, some things equal, some things, um, um, I guess, appear equal when they're of different scales, but using, using the scale tricks of photography to do that. And that's not a very eloquent description, but let's, let's move on. Sorry, Katie. Uh, and then why don't we get Sam and Megan's in the shot? Okay. This, this usually has, uh, it's a quirk of this virtual tour that there's no window here, but this is Sam's graphic um, expansion of this window pane, the pane of the window. So he, what he did is he took um, the pane of the each, each window pane here, which uh, you can't see, and uh, made it a photographic expansion and multiplied it to take that as his uh, take that as his multiple unit, and um, that's also a nice way I think to set up the sort of photographic uh, repetition we have later on in the show. And if we can get to um, Megan's work. If possible. Definitely. I think I'm operating on like a little bit of a lag. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. That's a cool picture. Right? Yeah. And so this is Megan's work, which is um well, what you want to click on the um detail real quick. This is um Megan is a photo practice, but also kind of a, a photo practice that veers into the sculptural. And what she's done is um, use these uh, sort of level vials um, to create this sort of undulating surface. Um, and um, kind of really nicely um, subvert the use of this tool, because to me, this work seems very kinetic and very unsettled. Um, because the liquid and the bubbles seem to speak to, um, you know, something much different than a fixed painting. But at the same time, this tool is used for the exact leveling 
of uh, of work or construction and things like that. So there's a nice contradiction. There's a nice pleasurable contradiction in this construction. A nice way to use the multiple, the idea of the multiple, because one one by itself to me would seem very serious and very sort of like uh, flat footed. But this sort of multiple is very pleasurable and very unsettled and uh, uses the idea of accumulation really nicely. And is also fun next to Noah's work here, his hand construction. And we go up the stairs. <clears throat> right. So immediate, immediately up the stairs, I don't know if we can turn to the right. There's another one of Sam's constructions. which I think are just really cool. And um, well, the, the hand icon really hasn't changed much in the history of computing, the sort of like finger and hand. Like, <laughs> like stuck with it. Um, okay, so as you can see, what do we can, we, can we pan a little bit more? Okay. Is it possible to get everybody's in the shot? Okay, well, we'll come around. Um, so here is on the very left, on the bottom is a little peek of Katie's work, which are these um, uh, tile constructions, which take on the dimension of a standard uh, two by four, a building element. Uh, standardized unit. Yeah. And in the detail picture, I'm sure we'll be able to see better. Yeah. So what Katie's done is, is these, these tile constructions are essentially in the same dimension as a two by four. They, I mean, Katie can talk about how they're actually constructed, but just to give you a general idea of what they are. And, um, they're a nice, they're, they're really interesting to me because they kind of make precious something using very common materials, like they're very slick. They talk about a building material, but they they also make reference to a sort of modernist sculpture practice and a very sort of rarefied field of, of sculpture um, in their sort of slickness, but they're also very approachable. Okay, so we can read. Coming around. There, there they are. Okay. So these are some pretty major works by Katia here, this big one here. And these are, um, again, a sort of accumulation of an industrial material. I'll let Katia extrapolate on that later when we uh, get back to it, what I mean by industrial material. But these are handmade. Uh, hand constructed um, in in certain reference to the body, in my opinion, and and again, Katya can extrapolate on that um, when she gets there. Um, but really great in person, and should definitely be seen in person. And then Megan. Okay, and here we go. So this is Megan's massive monumental wall piece. This is, um, I don't think it's spoiling it to say that this is um, a sort of inverted photographic process that is um, created by scanning the surfaces that she's photographing. And again, 
um, you know, we'll get into this, I'm sure, when we talk about the piece directly, but this is a tiled, essentially a tiled photographic image of a tiled uh, decorative element in front of uh, a, a large building in downtown Los Angeles. So Megan had to come in contact um, with the sidewalk one-to-one -one for each one of these panels that she's photographed here and presented as a tiled mosaic or tapestry perhaps. Whoa, don't bump into the artwork. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Where, where's the stanchions? Where's the gallery guard? Uh, okay, uh, dealer's choice. Dealer's choice to go to Colleen or, okay, Colleen first. Okay, so this is a very cool arrangement here. This is, I don't know if I would, I guess I would, it's at least one piece and then perhaps multiple iterations of another piece. Um, I guess let's turn around. And immediately I'm embarrassed because I'm blanking on the name of the filmmaker, but but essentially what, what Colleen has done is um, reproduced, whoa, yeah, there it is. This piece is called Reproducing H2O it was a very early um, silent film. And I'm, I don't know, are you gonna put it in the chat? Yeah, I put it in the chat. It's um, a film by Ralph Steiner. Yeah, <laughs> okay. 1929, there you go. <laughs> 1929, a 1929 film by Ralph Steiner, uh, which I think which I think you you had said was either one of the earliest examples of, of a recording of film or a very early sort of recording of water, excuse me, on film. Yeah. And what, and what Colleen had done is, is uh, tried to reproduce this film shot for shot, but of course she couldn't um, find every shot um, because of either lack of availability or lack of water. And in my mind, the absence um, really speaks to the assumed abundance of water in a really nice and, and um, elegant way. So on the left, you'll see Colleen's um, instances where she's un un unable to find a shot. And so she has a sort of stand in text. And the texts too read, you know, they're almost like, po they're almost poetic um, next to the image itself. And what this is, is this is presented on, um, uh, I do too, I look forward to the artist speaking about their own work as well in the text. Um, um, uh, presented on a monitor and uh, a video screen. And uh, if we wanna get out of this so we can get to the question. Can we, can we back out of this? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And then again, these, these, are, these are more instances of her water storage furniture, which are assembled from uh, I guess, emergency water units and then matched with a uh, custom cushion that she's made. And then finally to Seth, um, who presented these photographs, which I think, again, are a nice key to the idea of the multiple. Um, these are from Seth's book, Units, which is available at the show. And um, also, uh, yeah, if we turn around, There's uh, an example of his books as well, um, which are which are on a similar theme. Um, but yeah, I think I think now that we're here, we might as well get into this. And actually, Katie, um, Katie had a really good question for Seth. Do you do you want to go ahead and ask and and, and prompt to, uh, Seth? Do you want to? Do you want to do you want to ask him what you were you were wondering about his work? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so yeah, I love. I mean, 
I love the relationship that um, photography and sculpture can have um, because so often we experience, or at least, you know, I, my practice comes more or lives more in sculpture. Um, but I, I think about how so often your experience of sculpture is through the photograph. Um, but looking at your uh, photographs, you know, they're very much like about objects and about material um, as these sort of characters in the in the shot. Um, but I was wondering what your thoughts on the relationship between the objects uh, you photograph in your work and the sort of implied but unseen um, like human presence around them. And do you find yourself drawn to a type of material or type of narrative that might be tied to the material that you that you focus on? Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, it's a really good question. I my first response was to say that I'm I'm not that interested in in the people behind them. Um, but I the more I think about it, I think maybe that's not actually true because if I think about what I I'm not interested in photographing in the first place, it would be something like a pure idea of nature or, or on the other end, like a pure um, sort of like capitalism, um, just looking at a, a brand new shopping mall or something. But I feel like I kind of need um, a scene to see around the edge of something, how things are produced. And I think in these photos, you kind of see a bit of that, like construction sites, uh, displays uh, moments where you have um, this butting up between um, kind of like a DIY construction and a sense of some viewer out there. And, and whether that's an intentional display or whether it's, um, you know, um, just kind of accidental. Um, I think for, for me, that's, that's kind of the most interesting dynamic there. Um, and yeah, I, Generally, they're pretty mundane. Um, I don't have that much trust in what the photograph can really represent or communicate. Um, and I think I, I'm always kind of rooted in, in the history of photography, which so much of it is about forensics and evidence in the document. And, you know, you, you kind of look at some markings or some objects arranged on the ground and you try to piece together what sort of event happened there. And I, I like that uh, people can be kind of invisible actors behind the scenes. Um, and and you, might, you might sometimes wonder about the person who, um, in this case, maybe it was more of a natural force or combination of forces that um, created this form there. But um, with the pile of sod that we saw earlier, I mean, you might think a little bit about the individual who piled those up or, um, yeah. Um, I don't know if that answered it. I kind of rambled on toward the end there. I think that's that's awesome. And um, let me know, I guess, as we proceed to if there's anything you'd like me to pull up specifically image wise um, that you think like illustrates uh, some of the things you're talking about. Um, this might be a nice opportunity to jump back over to Colleen's piece now too. Um, we had a great question from Hannah for Colleen. And Hannah, are you okay if we do the same format? Would you like to ask your question to Colleen? We also have it written down and can read it too if you prefer. Sure, sure I'm happy to. Um, so I think, you know, Colleen's work alludes to prepper mentalities and practices, especially in the context of her solo exhibitions where her work is paired with other um, projects from her practice. But I'm curious in this presentation at Angel's Gate where the formal qualities of the work are perhaps prioritized over the conceptual ones, how do you see the ideological current in your work squaring with some of the other projects on view in a more formal capacity. Totally. Thanks, Hannah. Um, and thanks, Angels Gate and everyone. I'm super happy to be showing with these artists whose work I love. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think, you know, the idea of the multiple, I think all of us have such diverse kind of 
conceptual uh, rationale for the work that we're making and the multiple, the idea of the multiple is the thing that kind of formally ties us together. Um, though for me personally, I also do think about um, the multiple or the, the kind of repetition of an object in relation to something like stockpiling or hoarding of a certain kind of resource. Um, in my case, water. And, um, and then one of the other reasons that I was really excited to show at Angel's Gate is related to like the site itself, which um, for those of you, hopefully everyone's gotten a chance to see the actual um, exhibition physically. And if not, I'll just do my best to describe the kind of um, epic view <laughs> um, as you go up. Um, it's up on top of a hill and you have a, a wide view of both um, all of you know the kind of Long Beach industrial port um, with um, all the shipping containers and also the ocean. So you have this kind of mixture of like a repetition of um, rectilinear um, objects that are hoarding or rectilinear containers that are hoarding objects um, juxtaposed with you know the ocean, which I thought was a kind of nice formal connection, um, but also the history of Angel's Gate itself, which was actually a um, military facility that goes back to like the 1800s. Um, so this is something that I felt like was a nice kind of conceptual parallel for me, um, just in terms of thinking about its use in World War One as a place that um, stockpiled resources and weapons to actually defend Los Angeles. Um, in the wake of like a, you know, an attack or disaster. Um, so these are just kind of things that have like bumped around in my head as like, um, as, as things that kind of conceptually connect to some of those other themes that, um, that you're talking about in relation to the work that are maybe, I don't know, a combination or like a blur of like the formal and conceptual. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a really, really good question. Thanks, Anna. I wanted to follow up on that question um, and ask about like prepper literature. Like when I think about preparing for something, I find that to be like a like a self soothing behavior. And I'm wondering if there, what's the awareness around soothing, or is that language used in uh, preparation dialogues? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I like that. I like the lens of seeing it through the self soothe. Um, I always think about it through the lens of anxiety, <laughs> um, which maybe they're connected. You know, it's like there's there's a kind of anxiety or fear of something happening, and so to self soothe, you kind of you hoard and you try and gather materials and access for you know in case of an emergency or. Um, or something like that. So I do think that it is, um, it is something that comes out of a kind of uh, fear or anxiety or neurosis, but maybe it helps calm that in some way, though, um, to what success, I mean, <laughs> is, you know, is a question. Um, but, but yeah, so I, I think, it, yeah, it's, it's connected. And, um, and I guess, I guess my, yeah, my term for it would be anxiety, but it's definitely connected to the soothe, I think, too. Gotcha. Yeah, and I just I just wanted to to be clear for for the audience that that we are we are not necessarily talking about reproducing H two O. I think it is clear, but just um, that we're talking about the sort of furniture solutions that you've come up for a sort of like resource light world. You know, we're all in a drought world here in California, and so what you've kind of done is made an almost like um, um, uh, like Instagrammable seat for, you know, like, like fits, you know, fits into like, it's like a poppy color. It's like, you know, uh, uh, fits into decor and um, sort of, um, oh, I guess the prepper, what we we're talking, we were talking about earlier worlds in a way that I think like you, you also had a practice where you built a tiny house. And you also have a practice where you build sort of survival kits, you know, where you can then grow foods and things like that. Um, and so there's a place where those two aesthetics meet. It's where the kind of the right and the left meet. On right. A, yeah. On a, on a Pinterest board somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Totally. Um, right. The, and the yeah, the the furniture objects themselves are kind of 
I don't know, they're somewhere between like a minimalist sculpture and uh, slash furniture object. And then also they're, you know, they're made out of objects that are used for, for prepping. Um, right, because each so, one of these cubes is filled with water. Yeah, and it's, and it's filled with water. Um, right. But, um, but yeah, and then also this is just to jump back to the idea of the soothe um, in relation to the actual <laughs> video projection, which I think does have in the space, a kind of more meditative quality. You know, it's it, Steiner described that film, the original film that I based my remake on as like a cinepoem. So it's something to be observed for its beauty and its calmness and um, all the ways that water kind of um, mm -hmm. exists in natural, natural ways. So I do think that there's, yeah, there's this kind of um, contrast between that anxious quality and the soothe quality and maybe also the proper quality and like the uh aesthetic furniture quality <laughs> formal quality yeah right plus I, I wanted to interject with a little uh note from organizing the show i think it's personally i'll speak for myself in selecting works in an artist is having a full range like a full range from deeply conceptual to formal and being able to show the process in everybody's work and how that fits in. So I think, at least for me, Colleen fit that end of the spectrum that was had that highly conceptual aspect to the artwork that I think really kind of tied our show together. Um, outside of just being formally having connections to multiples. And I, and I, yeah, and I think, I think we should, I think we should move on for time, but I also did want to um, draw a connection between Colleen's work and even back to Seth's work where there is a sort of um, uh, the story of, of, where, of where a resource like water or in Seth's work, there's a picture that didn't make it into the show, but is in his books where uh, logs are between two trees. You know what I mean? So a log is, a, is a, a log is a unit of commerce where a tree is a resource, you know, and there's this kind of thing where water gets parsed up into units and then is keepable and sellable. And so there's a there's a way too where when things become a unit or things become a multiple, they can be they can be sold as lots or they can be arranged into furniture and utilized given use value, um, as opposed to when they're wild or they're still a tree, you know, or they're still a grass sod. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I jumped us outside. Um with the thought process of Sam is another piece that um, engaged the building or engaged the history of the building. So I wondered if maybe we could um, sit, like have you talk about how you thought about site specificity here, Sam. Yeah, sure. Um, so generally when I'm in a show or asked to be in a show or in a new space, I really like to try to find a connection architecturally that I'm attracted to. Um, so in talking about a show about multiples, I, in never actually seeing the space, you know, doing a site visit and, and trying to be inspired by the space itself. Um, this outdoor space rang true to that attraction, right? That like these windows um, that have been not boarded up, but covered up and, and kind of um, show these aesthetic qualities that I think are um, a little heightened by the fact that they are um, non-functional now uh, was really attracted to me, really attracted me to like want to play with that. So, you know, they're, they're um, all in a row and all kind of very formally lined up and, and um, equally spaced and, and then uh, truth be told, um, I was limited in how I could interact with the surface of the building because of um, asbestos and, and um, um, just uh, uh, historical kind of uh, maintaining that um, surface. So I played off of what the building gave me, which was this um, sign rail that um, I could hang my replication of that window from. So that window is um, a copy of the one to the upper left of it, uh, all handmade with um, recycled and scrapped material and wood that I had around um, and then painted um, with multiple coats too. And, and yet you of... managed to make it exactly the same. <laughs> 
it's it's a little different, but yeah, I, I, I think the, I think the beauty of that for me is that you can't, you know, I have this kind of side practice where I've I've replicated things in the past and installed them and and not told anybody and just left them to kind of be discovered. So right. this this was an attempt to copy, but also right. you know it made its own kind of including um, the same piece. Yeah, and I don't I don't mean to interrupt, but but Al, um, Alabaster brought up a great thing. She asked, was it meant to be in line with the others? And I think, I mean, I'd love for you to respond to that. I definitely have my, my you know, so many amazing thoughts about this one being out of line with the others. But, but well, was, yeah. A lot of times when you get into installs and, and you're doing something site specific, uh, I, I've just learned over the years to not fight it, you know, and and not try to make something be what I want it to be, but let the space give me what it kind of wants the piece to be. And in this case, that the what the window is hanging on is a sign rail that was there that I could use and not have to drill into the tile of the asbestos. So I went with that because it then highlight, you know, once I put it up and I could see it, I, you know, it's a little wonky, it's a little off, it's a little different than all the other windows. And I feel like that in so many ways, um, given the title, also has a little bit of self-reference as right. well. Yeah, I think it, I think it's really I think it ends up being a really poetic and kind of poignant taking up of the history of the building of the military history that Colleen was talking about, and that it's like almost like the soldier that can't march right, like it can't stay in formation. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's kind it's of like this. Off. Yeah, I mean, there's that, you know, it's it's like uh, everyone is in formation except this one. And it, you know, to, to be honest, this one, when you first hung it, it drove me crazy because it was like off. You, make, <laughs> you like you managed you, to you weren't letting it go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you, so I'm like, it's, it's, it's not it's not level. But but it was almost like in its agitation, the way it was agitating me, the way it kind of hung off the building, the way it was it was so. You know, you replicated this crack here on the bottom of the of the window to the left, and yet it was so obviously an add-on. It hovered in a really irritating way between being like imitation and then also pointing it out. But in that stumbling, in tripping over it, you kind of you kind of look at all the other windows. You know, it it sets off this whole side of the building, and in the architecture, sets off its previous use and its history without ever mentioning the words military, without ever mentioning the words um army base or anything like that like you just you have the building activated uh right away because this whole building was a very very utilitarian building so i really love this piece for the way it does that without without ever mentioning the army once i think that's a very nice read thank you and absolutely uh taps into a little sense of humor i think yeah if if my work is is accomplishing what, what i would hope for uh, there's a little bit of that every time. Um, so thank you for that comment too. Do you want to you head next? Can you get well, us back in the building yeah, let's go, or is let's the door go back, locked? Let's go back upstairs. <laughs> We're locked up. We got to go to the beach. Yes, uh, I can get us. You want to go, go upstairs? Back, let's go back. Um, let's go back upstairs okay. and maybe get to Katya's work. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That, yeah. Yeah, so we'll do Katya's and then Megan's and then, and then we'll go to Katie. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, had a, I did have a question and I'll shut up after this. I had a question about Katya's work because, you know, she's made mention in her artist statement um, in the past about learning a sort of handcraft trade um, involving fabric, but she's using um, a sort of mass produced geared toward a sort of uh, I guess a, 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 a feminine product, geared toward <laughs> right? Am I am I in the danger zone? Uh, to make I think, I think you to produce it, to... yeah. I think you should probably rescue me. Yes, yeah. Um, here I am. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I actually have been. This whole conversation is getting like my gears turning even more so than than they were before about like how many like different through lines we're all 
like all we ha I'm seeing all of these different connections, right? Like between my work and Sam's work in terms of using like pre-made things that exist in the world and kind of like re, you know, subverting them into something other, like, you know, that he did with his puzzle pieces. And that's, that's essentially what I'm doing here is I'm using nylons, more specifically pantyhose, and even more specifically than that, pantyhose that are pre-packaged skin tones to kind of shift them, you know, through a hand process into something like otherworldly that, you know, something that feels really familiar and comforting and kind of has, you know, the through line that Colleen was talking about, about like uh, them feeling soothing, you know, in some ways because they're nests, they're meant to like kind of quiet the outside world. You can interact with the work, you can put yourself inside of it. Um, but yeah, essentially they're, they're, you know, the nylon is a stand in for, the, for skin and, and, you know, these things are kind of stand-ins for the body um, in one way or another, but they're not really meant to, they're not really meant to be anything specific. I mean, they are, uh, you know, they have like an obvious look to them. They're very like womb-like certainly, but you know, the, this is actually something that we talked about in our um, studio visit, you know, I like, this idea of repetition, and I like the idea of texture. I'm drawn to artwork that also has, like, you know, that has those qualities in it. And like, for me, you know, I think other people see them as maybe like obsessive or really labor intensive, but for me, frankly, they're really actually like pretty meditative and really like nice to, to work on. And I can really like get into a flow state with them. and. I mean, what a buzzword, but like, <laughs> but, but truly like there, there, there really are, I do it because I enjoy it. Right. And I think part of the material selection too is, is that I think maybe like a part of me wants to make things a little bit difficult. Like I chose fiber because it's kind of like the underdog material, right. It's, it's not really like in the canon of, in the same way that painting is or photography even, even though like photography is a pretty new medium. So I like infusing my work with this idea of like femininity and the feminine and feminism, like all of those things as well. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to ramble a little bit. Give me another question. <laughs> um, I mean, even, you know, we, we had talked about in your studio visit, like the idea of repetition or cellular repetition, mm -hmm. you know, and even reproduction is in some of the mother, mama, child, they're, they're in, it's, it's the text and the sort of, um, uh, there's, a, there's a correlation between the construction and the, and the, the sort of overt uh, text and then the sort of construction of the piece. Yeah. I guess that was the question. That was more. Yeah, of a I was going to say, is that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, I, mean, and... I mean, yeah. Was that was that part of the conception of the piece itself when you started doing these? What do you mean exactly? Like, are you saying? Are you asking? Uh, like, am I thinking? Do I like imagine what the piece looks like? Did and you, did, in this, in in engaging this technique, did you set out to create a piece that had a body reference and and referenced sort of uh, fem femininity and reproduction and things like that? Did you? Yeah, yeah, that you yeah. yeah. I think so. I think, I mean, I kind of came to this method through trial and error. I mean, I kind of, it's funny, actually, I think, Nathan, you said this, um, at a certain point in one of your interviews, I started out as like a bad painter <laughs> many, many, yeah. many years ago. Yeah. And that was kind of like what that was like my idea of like what an artist is before sure. like, I knew anything about what it is to be an artist. And now, like 17 years into it, I just choose materials that like I find um, nice to hold. Like, also, mm. my day job is as a graphic designer and I and I kind of at a certain point I started really missing holding things and touching materials and using my hands like in the studio so through a lot of trial and error I ended up coming to this process I used to do embroidery I used to do sculptural knitting 
I think like I just have a three-dimensional mind, like I'm good at thinking in space and my, and I kind of kept searching for a process that would allow for me to like, you know, like distract my like thinking brain and then let my hands do the figuring out of like what it's going to be. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, it, it does. It does. Um... I mean, in the way that a cell doesn't necessarily think about how it's reproducing it, it it's a natural function of its. It, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah, totally. And I think like, you know, these, these things, they like, to me, I try not to like define them too strictly, but I feel like the through line is like, you know, there is like this cellular or like bacterial or cancerous or like fungal something happening. And the, and, and like, and I'm also kind of like in Megan's work, like there's a scale shift. Right. And all of, and you know, like using, you know, using all of these tools that kind of create something totally, mm -hmm. totally kind of new that isn't, um, yeah, because cells are not this size. <laughs> Well, well, you. Uh, I, I hate to leave you, but I think I think we should we should move on for time. And because you mentioned Megan's work, can we can we go ahead and turn to your work, Megan? Certainly. Yes, many cells, many <laughs> cells coming together. Um. Who wants we'll also dig we'll dig back into the comments um after we yes yeah yeah also if people, are, if people are Don't putting questions, yeah yeah we'll get to you sam That's do you perfect. want do you want to do you want to yeah i do yeah <laughs> uh specifically because um i helped megan with this project and i feel very intimate with myself at this <laughs> um you you had said photos earlier but just to uh, clarify it's um uh, I think right. an eight by 11 bed scanner, uh, okay. almost 500 scans plus, um, Megan can elaborate, um, exactly, but, um, this is a, you know, a, a first large scale iteration of a body of work she's been working on for a while now. Um, this project came specifically out of having this wall and getting the opportunity to do a large scale piece and she knocked it out of the park. I really feel like this show specifically brought out the best um, in her practice and this work specifically because it was a it was a, a passion project that we didn't know if we would be able to do. So thank you to Angels Gate for that. Um, Megan, would you like to expound? Yes, yeah, for sure. So. Um, I consider myself, I guess, like, a, I guess, well, not I guess, I consider myself a sculptor, but the, uh, in an untraditional image maker. So I make a photographic image with a flatbed scanner, like Sam said. So it's, it's a pretty like low tech solution. I take my laptop and like a long cord in my flatbed and I take the lid off of it and then press it up against things to capture images. This is the first time I've been able to work, um, in a way that individual tiles created a larger image. I'm usually cropping things and getting like a very close up, um, essentially like scan of them and then presenting that in my artwork. And uh, I was really drawn, I guess, so this is one of the first projects that I've been able to use the flatbed scanner and relate it to the idea of a document. So I consider myself kind of a, um, like a beginning archivist and I consider this almost like a like a condition report or like a you know a, a, a representation of how the sidewalk looked for the three weeks um, that we scanned it and so um, what was kind of thrilling is just the familiarity I guess of of this terrazzo sidewalk in front of a building close to where I work in downtown Los Angeles and I had taken a, a walking tour downtown a couple of years ago where an artist was pointing out the terrazzo sidewalks and identifying them as kind of clues of how buildings used to be used. And so um, with this one in particular, it's in front of the Arcade Theater on Broadway in between 4th and 5th. And the theater is now a stereo store. Um, so they've they've essentially like walled off the actual access to the theater and then it's, it's essentially a retail space 
um, although it was never opened while we were there. So I don't know if it's actually still still in business or not. Um, but in pressing the, you know, the essentially like my flatbed scanner to the sidewalk and moving along from right to left to capture these images, um, you know, captured like you know, the gum, the gum stains, the cracks in the sidewalk. Um, there's probably like dog and pee and poop. Um, oh, oh, there is. Yeah, <laughs> there's like pigeon feathers, um, you know, wrappers, trash and stuff like that. So anyways, I say that to say it's already different. Um, I've walked by it recently and there like uh, the city has filled in some of the cracks with asphalt. So already this document is out of date. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, I, I guess, you know, to like relate it back to like why I use the scanner to make imagery. I am really interested in like the authority that we give or like me personally that I give certain presentations of information like books, um, like a, you know, like an image file, um, like, you know, like a lecture, you know, there's like if it takes up a certain structure, I tend to just kind of, you know, give it some credence and I'd like to, you know, continue to examine that. Um, and this piece in particular, when you get closer to it, it really does break down where you see like um, the, the images don't exactly touch each other um, precisely. So it, it really isn't a precise piece when you get up close. Yeah, and that has reference to like the digital stitching and the sort of glitching of a, of a digital process, which we all know photographs are an impression of especially now more than ever like software light you know being interpreted by software and we still take them as this is what seth was saying actually earlier too about seth uh photographs being taken as sort of proof or or the facts when we know that they are um not so um and also i think there's there is a juxtaposition too between your two practices in that you know, as you say, like, as I always describe you, I, I, I describe your practice as the inversion of a traditional photographer in which you are, you know, the photographer usually likes to stand back and capture the whole scene as the sort of like recorder of truth. And Seth is taking that up in, in his position in a way to almost answer Katie's question. The presence of the human is Seth's sort of questioning frame. You, on the other hand, are like touching the, the gum. Like your apparatus is like in contact with the pee and the gum and everything and sort of like getting a sort of like um, uh, smell level uh, document of the surface in a way that's, um, I think in its scale, the way you have here has a lot of authority, um, but um, is clearly showing the holes in the sort of photographic proof or, or, or authority, if that makes sense. What do you, what, how did you, how did you come to scanning things as opposed to shooting photographs? Well, it was kind of uh, a way to, I used to sneak it when I was at work. Like I used to like sit next to a photocopier and, and I would just throw things on the photocopier to be like, I made some sort of gesture, you know, during my like nine to five day job of like my own creative practice. And so it kind of grew out of like access to essentially like a photocopier and then ultimately a flatbed scanner. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd, I'd also uh, interject and say that yeah, I think the physical contact, you know, I, bringing Megan back into a sculptural practice as well that like the taking the uh, flatbed uh, scanner outside into nature, into the real world and pressing it on things and touching and, and, and taking a, a it, it's a different relationship than a photograph can give you uh, image wise. And then recreating that structure in this case uh, for a one-to-one, -one, which is right. something that she hasn't done yet is, is specifically uh, pretty special because it's also bringing out the imperfections and the um, issues in that relationship, right? Like that's not exactly obviously how that looks. Um, but her hand and the way she put it back together mm -hmm. and, and, and almost similar to a puzzle uh, and my own bias is that her interpretation is there. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's what really makes this a little bit right. exciting, well, her, her, exciting her, future for her practice. 
Yeah, well, her, her clear authorship is there in the sculptural nature of the work, whereas, you know, a photograph can still kind of, kind of masquerade as a sort of document of the facts, even though there is clearly an author. Maybe. Yeah, and the whole the whole time we we're doing the piece, people were like, "Why aren't you taking photos?" <laughs> yeah. And and I think that itself is is pretty fascinating, right? Like that relationship yeah. between her physical contact with the the space and the the actual floor was something yeah. that people were walking by, especially downtown, yeah. and and were like, "What the hell are you doing? Get off the ground! That's gross." And but you just, we, you just, she just shook yeah. her fist and said, "I'm a sculptor," and like, <laughs> <laughs> "You'll never understand." Um, anyways, uh, we do need to move on for okay. time, Yes, but we can definitely Megan, get back Megan, into do you have that. Anything, do you have any concluding thoughts to that or before we do anything? I, well, like we've said before, we were the fifth or sixth most absurd thing downtown going on at any time. So I don't think people actually paid too much attention to us. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. And, and I think this is actually is a very good moment to pan to Katie's because of the idea of both the idea of the cellular sort of building up of things and also a sort of adherence to a sculpture practice. And, um, um, uh, and then maybe in terms of scale, because I think one of the questions for Katie was, um, which I think is actually, I think it's maybe not the right question, but I think it's a good question. It's like, what's the optimal span of your work? Like what's the optimal scale? And so maybe scale is a good way into your work. I, I kind of love that question because I think yeah. it's a really funny question in relationship to this work because there's like a funny logic to the work where if I'm thinking about, okay, well, how many tiled two by fours should they be? Should there be, there's like, well, there's either two or there's four, you know, that's the, <laughs> that's right. the answer to that. Um, and actually in thinking that, wouldn't it be funny if there were like three, <laughs> like it's three yeah. tiled two by fours. Um, but yeah, I, in terms of like the, the span, it's like super, uh, limited to the logic of the piece. So you have the, the two by four and the specific size of the two by four and the specific size of like the white bathroom tile. And all of that is like dictated by what that material actually is and where it comes from. Um, and so like thinking about this work, um, and a lot of my work uses like just straight from Home Depot material uh, and kind of mass produced industrial like units. Um, and I think of them as kind of being like an every person's like minimalism or blue collar minimalism or like attainable minimalism that's like coming straight out of the store. Um, and at the same time, there's this sort of uh, instant recognition of the material that's kind of hard to shake. So like, downstairs in the photographic pieces, there's the sort of like gray pavers. And with this one, like the white bathroom tile, like it really can't be totally transformed. Um, so with the like two tile two by fours, there's this like allure of the sleekness and the like cleanness that can kind of draw you in, but you can't really get away from the tiles and the two by fours themselves, which I think allows you to float between like a formal conversation uh, that sort of has that art historical nod to the grid and like conversations around mass industrial production and labor and class and like all of that stuff. Um, and then also Sam, you mentioned like humor in your piece and how you sort of always think about, okay, can there be this element of humor? And that really resonated with me because um, I think this work is funny um, <laughs> because you have this sort of like, they present so serious, like so straight faced. Um, but ultimately, you know, like in my mind, there's this kind of silliness with the bespoke fussiness of the custom cut, like 45 tie, you know, kind mm -hmm. of 45 super meticulousness of it all that ultimately render the function of a two by four is useless mm -hmm. and that the functional tile like becomes decorative and it's like the most like barely decorative, like baseline decorative you could get. So, you know, I think something like I, I look at these and think of them as being like silly, I guess. <laughs> and I don't know how I got there, but. Um, well, 
But, but there's something, I mean, you know, in the, the, the sort of big male modernists who would use bricks and shit like that, and it was so serious. That was before Home Depot. Like Home Depot is hilarious. Like Home Depot is kind of a comedy of like a human comedy. When you go there, it's like ridiculous. Like a tragic uh, comedy though. Tragic, yeah, <laughs> right. And yeah, and so this is all the story of us trying to improve our lives through better construction, right? DIY. There was no DIY really. When mm-hmm. the sort of the sort of modernist that you're taking, like that has all been translated into the sort of conversation of DIY, of sort of weekend warrior stuff. Mm-hmm. Totally. Well, and you encapsulated this 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 material which has a, a function in building and you wrapped it in another building material that <laughs> I just I love that idea of like you like almost in a uh, just like cocooned it <laughs> with this <laughs> other material that you can also get from the same store and, and it turns out that the math is I think that's the real beautiful part of this piece that excited me about it besides the humor was that the math involved to, to figure that out and to to actually put those two parts together and 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 I you know I don't I don't know how that works in your practice but I'd be interested to hear more about like when you get those things and you start playing with them mm. what speaks to you you know how do you how do you move forward with an idea from that stage Yeah I think also the choice of material I think in a lot of ways is is like almost autobiographical like rooted in the sort of material that I you know grew up with or recognize and I know that's true for a lot of people and there's this kind of like you know I guess hominess to all of it um but yeah you're talking about the pleasure like the pleasure of Home Depot and the pleasure of things coming together and even being in the store and like it's like a you know kid in a candy store and you're like putting things together um but I'd also say like, there's, there's also like a masochistic streak uh-huh. in a lot of my work too, so. and I, and it's something that I would love to get away from. I mean, no, I think that's where the, no, no, no. Me and Sam say no. <laughs> but I, I mean, I think there's also, there's, there's an interesting personal touch there, which is the sort of person who comes in sort of class tableau that you do come from, who is then gone into the sculpture practice, then got an MFA and like learned about, learned about fine art and things like that. And this, this present, the presentation is very fine art, the presentation. And in fact, if these works were to be sold, we would treat them as fine arts and pack them and put them in crates and things like that. So there is something Which interesting. Is, oh, so good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do, I'd love, we had we that We would wrap them in around. two by fours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were, yeah. But we had that conversation when they came into the space of like, okay, how should they lean? Should they do the like modernist lean? Um, mm-hmm. And like, make that reference, but also we realized like, okay, but also, you know, to lean them up against something is maybe how a two by four would function in the world as well. Um, right. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I like the sort of slippage between those. Timekeeper Sam, we're downstairs to okay. Noah. Okay. <laughs> we're skipping your work. Uh, we can get to that after we t- everyone gets a moment as much as I would like to take up more of the floor. Uh, I really am excited to talk about this piece. Yeah. Um, we didn't really get to touch on it on the walkthrough. So, you know, Noah, I would like you to really kind of um, pick up where the, um, my own ignorance of the history of this piece, but you know, this was, the excitement about getting to put this in the show and for Noah to recreate something that um, is personal and dear to him from an uh, exhibition so long ago, I think was was kind of the jumping off point for us. And then, you know, obviously connections to multiples and then some of the formal qualities um, tied in. But, but what really, uh, from my standpoint as a maker was exciting was to, to put this piece in a space which did everything but say, don't put it here. And uh, we, you know, Noah figured out a way to do it. it. Yeah. So please talk about that and kind of your, your history with this work and what it means to you. Sure. All right. Yeah. Well, um, thanks everybody for taking a look at what we've done. this show has been a long time coming. It was so nice to see it all come together. It's so excellent. 
couldn't have been happier. Um, this work was shown once before when I was an undergraduate at UCLA uh, in 2010. And I showed it, it was well received and I thought it would be really nice to show it again sometime in the future and never had an opportunity to until now. Uh, simply there wasn't really the right kind of a space to house it. And when I was invited to participate in this project, after looking at the space and getting an understanding of its location and the restrictions and just how the show was going to operate, it started to feel like it was gonna make, you know, all, a lot of sense to have this project be a part of the show. Um, so part of what I was interested in using this piece in the show is uh, the location, like a lot of artists have already touched on before, um, the history of militaristic strategies and storing. This piece comes out of a military history. It was initially used to bridge gaps on valleys uh, in earlier times when we didn't have things like hydraulics or electricity. Um, and when I was first introduced to the structure, it was more so meant to represent rank investment in the arena that I was operating in, which was Boy Scouts. And so it was stripped of its initial function, but meant to symbolically somehow represent something similar um, and had text placards hanging above to represent how it was meant, you know, like which rank you were moving from and towards. Like Later on, I started to think about it. Yeah, is there any, Stop, is there any are there views that we can see some of the, or is there a detail shot? No, sorry to interrupt, buddy. This yeah, is no, no, it's fine. Yeah, yeah I, 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 uh, I started just thinking about it as like a weird, like a, some sort of like a, cause so, so the title of the piece is a crossover ceremony and then playing it straight. It's meant to represent a, cer you know, a ceremonial crossover from one rank to another. And I started thinking about that as just in terms of like kind of going from childhood to adulthood. So some sort of an allegorical representation of this thing. Uh, and in my mind, the, the work is mostly meant to give somebody like a, a passageway through being brought up one way that wasn't such a great fit going through it and just kind of coming out of the other side feeling like you still have a lot of things to figure out um there we go so specifically uh you know it like the the text kind of guides you through this experience of like the straight and narrow but then your your own personal i suppose reaction or 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 what like what 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 you ended up doing versus what you were being told you were supposed to do in relationship to that like kind of tight rubric that you were given but who, who's to kind of talk a little bit more about the, the the relationship to the to the overarching theme thematic of the show um knots and lashings which are the strategies that are most mostly employed in the fabrication of this project are extraordinarily repetitious and it was something that I excelled at. Um, I was continuously asked to design and, fat and, I don't know, produce the gateways and perimeters for different Boy Scout competitions that I was involved in when I was a youngster. Um, and I would start out with a group of guys that I would direct and then eventually it would just turn into me finishing it off um that was the part i liked about it i didn't really like the 
more macho stuff. I kind of like to just like tie ropes and make structures. So, so it's not explicitly, you know, like resentful or negative. There, there, there is some some aspects and elements that are all about like. I don't know, finding your own place and figuring out how to fit in within this social group that doesn't make too much sense. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the craftsmanship, to touch back on that, when, when we came to do the studio visit with you, it, it, being in between studios or not having the space to put this up was in your friend's backyard. And I just thought that was that was a really a beautiful transition between the two shows and getting to see something that you um, were, were so excited to bring back out. And then uh, we didn't know whether it would work or not. And then to the added details on the on the lashings and the edge, edges and the and the moments of tying the knots are just really. Um, mm -hmm. But there's also beautiful there's also little moments. Right. And there's also like an, a, a resonance between, you know, the Katya's work with the handcraft that was passed down from woman to woman in a sort of feminine world into the sort of uh, handcraft of the knots and things that were learned in Boy Scouts, which is, a, which is an organ of the military, um, you know, which is uh, of, of Noah's work to, you know, learn to tie, you know, this sort of handcraft and, and that, that the handcraft allowing a place for uh, one to emerge in a sort of rigid structure or something like, or to make, to make, to make a craft of their own or make a structure of their own within uh, a rigid structure or to take up, take up structure um, through the hand. Um, I think appears both in like Katya's uh, cellular pieces and Noah's knots, Noah's creating of this bridge, this ceremonial bridge. Um, um, you know they're obviously very different pieces, but there's some there's something there in the sort of realms they are like embracing and subverting because because like Katya is embracing a sort of you know the handcraft that she was she you know obviously she loves the handcraft that she was taught in the same way Noah um, seems to have really excelled and, and appreciated the handcraft he was taught, but they're using it to sort of like subvert and expand upon those techniques. And I think it's really beautiful and really uh, poignant in resonating with the site. Nathan, we have to move on to you. I don't think so. I think we have to move on to Katie first. <laughs> well, yeah, I, de I, definitely don't wanna, I definitely don't want to walk by that second piece of Katie's without mentioning it for uh, discussion yeah. too, because I was under the assumption, and correct me if I'm wrong, Katie, but w one of the two of those is a reproduction by hand that you then photographed to look like the original. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. And I'll be brief because I know we're short on time. So I'll just talk about them a little bit. Um, but the one on the left, and I think we could even zoom in on the one on the left. Um, there's sort of a funny story. I made the one on the left back in grad school as a sculpture. Um, and I remember at the time I had a professor like in critique call it um, Carl Andre with a hat. <laughs> it was a, a sick burn uh, and also, <laughs> Uh, made me go back and kind of reconsider the work and try and pull it in a different direction because like while I like being haunted by the ghosts of minimalism and modernism I also wanted to bring it more into a place of like pathos and humor so the work became photographic and the trick like if you want if you could call it the trick is where the photo on the left is the full scale version with like Home Depot pavers and the photo on the right is a one inch to one foot minor, minor, ugh, miniature, miniature, there we go, <laughs> where I sort of cast the little concrete blocks um, and it's a, a half a shot glass and a little cocktail umbrella um, <laughs> just to simulate the original one. So, so yeah, the trick is playing with scale and perception and like photographic representation uh, as Nathan was describing when he took us through. Um, but also with the material I was thinking about, again, the pathos and humor of like a staycation, <laughs> which I think can come through with like the ready to go Home Depot pavers in the full scale one. And then in the miniature with the, with the cocktail 
uh, umbrella and the shot glass. And, and I was like almost imagining um, like in a way that a tiki drink is supposed to kind of whisk you away and take you on a vacation of the mind. Uh, with the patios, you have this kind of idea of leisure or like imagine leisure, but like leisure on a budget. <laughs> uh, and with like the grayness and dullness of the patio, I kind of imagined like I wanted the imagined vacation to be sort of limited and boring, uh, which I think can be funny and sad and relatable and like autobiographical, but mass produced and ubiquitous. And all of that feels like it's an attempt to flee that formal conversation that sits in a relationship to just modernism and minimalism. I think the pathos comes through definitely in the in the in the shock of the realization of what we're looking at for sure. I I um the night of the opening um had a really beautiful experience with a, a couple that was look, looking at your piece and going back and forth and analyzing it and trying to figure out what the differences <laughs> were and what was going on. And I and and no words were said, but you could see that. It, they were just like oh, something. I know it's here. I'm gonna find it. And uh, you know, it was a really kind of I think special moment. That this show specifically has a couple little those peekaboos that we talked about earlier that um, for sure make it totally. make it nice to explore in person. But um, what a wonderful uh, ability that um, Angels Gate has to put this modeling together so that people can see the show as mentioned sure. in the comments that might not have been able to come in person so thank you totally yeah thanks angels gate i'm totally blown away by this um where to can we pull go up to nathan's and then we can at least get everybody in uh, okay if we must <laughs> I'd talk about your window. Yeah, we can get to it. Um, yeah, which one is this going to be? That's that's a good picture. So Nathan, when when we did the studio visit with you, because we also did that with each other, uh, mm -hmm. one of the things that you were working on at the time was, uh, you know how exactly you were going to use this piece in the space um yeah and thus one of the questions that you kind of got grouped under in this mm. uh q a with the artist is um what the optimal span was and and i thought that was interesting because you were battling that before we'd even gotten the space and then it just worked out so organically right. once you got there um i was wondering if you could touch on that a little bit as well as talk about the piece, obviously. Sure, sure. And I think, I think, um, I think the first thing that the why I that I should talk about is why I juxtapose these two in these two objects in the first place. And um, and I think when we get to the span, it'll it'll come out in that it'll come out in the wash of that conversation. Um, um, what what I've done is I've juxtaposed uh, a photograph, which is a family photograph, and um, it's a photograph of me. It's a personal family photograph with a uh, an artificial tree. And the reason I juxtapose these two things is that um, I was looking to find some things that I think people um, tend to approach emotionally rather than rather than sort of analytically, which is to say nature or the natural or or the family or the familial, people tend to um, take these as a sort of a given, a sort of, uh, again, a natural state of things. It's what allows um, an object like a fake tree to operate in an office. When you're, when you're in your doctor's office and you see a fake tree, even though your rational brain um, understands that it's fake and can understand it's artificial, what it does is it conjures the idea of the natural um, and it allows it to um, soften a space or bring that sort of idea in. It sort of defeats the rational uh, brain or defeats the idea of signification in that your sentiment towards the idea of the natural is 
conjured by this, um, by this reproduction. Um, in the same way, uh, a family photograph, even though that we understand photographs to be inherently multiple and caused all sorts of uh, crises of aura uh, when they were first brought onto the scene as art and you know, in, as a technology you know, a couple hundred years ago, um, a family photograph can take on this aura or stand-in of the familial. And um, this photograph, which I presented, was one such photograph. I only knew one copy of it growing up, um, and it and it it its 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 objectness uh, is a stand-in for for a very emotional subject, which is the family. The family again being sort of in the realm of things that people tend to emotionally respond to, like with nature. Like nature is this idea beyond. Uh, um, beyond the human and yet the idea of nature itself is a human conception. Um, it's trapped within language. We have a description for it. Um, all this being said, um, I was interested in, a, in, in, um, in defeating that um, or, or, or this gesture that, that um, allowed me to point out the sort of repetition of these things while also sort of creating another work, which was the accumulation. And so to get back to the idea of the span or where this ends, it really is responsive to the site because I could technically make the point that I'm making um, with two, um, but there is another uh, sort of expression at play, which is the expression of the installation of an artwork. And it's like where that stops, where you declare that this is a sort of artwork, this has agency as an artwork, this takes up space as an artwork, that has its own demands. And so two seemed underwhelming, even though it technically made my point that, um, you know, this repetition, this sort of like idea of um, the natural and the uh, um, sort of originality of a family photograph or the originality of, of the familial can be defeated in by being faced with its repetition. Two might, might make that point, but it would be unsatisfying as an artwork. And so the span was, in my mind, to satisfy the sort of conditions of, of, of again, regaining a sort of aura or regaining a sort of agency as an artwork. Um, and so, and so that, that happened almost organically. I feel like I talked for a very long time. Oh, no, that was nice. To, that was nice to hear. <laughs> Uh, some okay. of the personal context. Great. And then That's maybe we can important. wrap up, um, Nathan, with your question for Hannah. Yeah, okay. And so, so, so again, so as we mentioned earlier, are we out of time here? Is that what's happening? Yes. Okay, okay. Sorry about that. Um, um, but we're going to miss your work in the front. That, that's okay. That's okay. Okay, okay. She's okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so, okay, so I'm going to come out of my days about talking about my own work. I'm going to pull it back. Um, can we talk, is there a shot of Hannah's work in the, in the, the holders there? I don't think it's in the holders, but there is a, a shot with the text. So we were, yeah, we were very lucky to um, get a writer to produce a work of her own, in my opinion, um, in response to the ideas of the show. And um, this is Hannah down here. Um, yeah, full in place. Okay, so we can bring this up. This is, a, this is a, a text that I believe is available online as a PDF, is that true, Cecilia? Yes? Okay, yes. This, this work is available online, so I encourage everyone in the chat to take it down and read it. But um, this, this, I, I have a lot of um, respect for Hannah because she kind of took this on without um, necessarily seeing a lot of works herself. She kind of dug in. And so my question for Hannah is, is as a writer, um, when being asked to produce a work like this, like what, like did you, do you sort of pick one or two ideas to dig into? And, and, and to what extent do you consider this a work on its own? Um, yeah, take it away. Um. Well, first, thanks for uh, including me. It was really a fun assignment to be asked to make something specifically for a group show. 
Um, and to answer your question, um, yeah, I sort of, you know, uh, in looking at the work only via images and talking to you guys about the idea for the show, I did sort of grab onto a couple key concepts. Um, I was first of all drawn to actually the title of your work, Nathan. Um, mm. Sincerity um, sort of struck out to me and because specifically I've been thinking a lot about um, duplicitousness and deceit in my own research um, with regard to hoaxes and um, lies and um, sort of being fooled and what that means in a sort of performance art capacity. Yeah. Um, because I was because you can be sincere and duplicitous at the same time. You can yes. be, yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of where I ended up, I think, in the text. Um, so I was thinking about the contrast there and drawing upon some theory that I had been reading at the time, which sort of perfectly aligned um, with um, what I was what I was thinking about um, when you proposed this idea. So, and I like the assignment because um, professionally, I, I write a lot of press releases and I also write art criticism, but I'm not usually included in the exhibition. It's always sort of external. So it was a fun opportunity to sort of think about the work more as an object, which is something I had done once before um, and wanted to uh, present this work in a way that felt consistent with the previous version that was in a different group show. Um, I like the idea of the takeaway, also it's a multiple. Um, so in thinking about sincerity, I'll be quick, and um, duplicitousness, um, my question, my sort of first question was, because all of the objects in the show are made from materials that often have a function, um, quite literally, you know, from Home Depot for storage, for replication, what have you. Um, I was thinking about, are those objects sincere? Do they have a static meaning, regardless of the time, place, and context within which they're received? So um, in looking at these other authors and texts I had been reading, I sort of assembled a variety of responses to reception. Um, and it unfolded rather naturally, and I came about this sort of circular argument where the end result was pretty much no, it's um, we are the meaning of an object is wildly dependent on the time, place, context, uh, perspective of the viewer at the time that they're engaging with it. Um, and so the trick that I tried to sort of unfold in the text was that, you know, we consciously know that this is true, um, that we, as individuals, when we approach a thing, we pull on certain symbols, certain significances that we deem to be important about that thing to sort of explain its relationship to us in a given moment. Mm -hmm. um, and at Home Depot, a cement tile is a cement tile and you're probably gonna build a patio. But when you take it out of that context into the artist studio, it takes on a whole different valence. Um, so we know that this is true because your experience of those objects changes with you as you move through time and space. Um, so, while that's a conscious understanding that we have, we often in a given moment ignore that, I think. And we um, sort of succumb to the delusion, I, I termed it, that you know an object is what it is in a given moment. And so that's how we're fooled right. kind of almost by ourselves. You know, not fool me once because we know better now, it's happened before, fool me twice, um, you know. Shame on me. We, um, we, well, we, we want to be fooled. We purchase, we purchase the exactly. deception when we We win. enjoy being fooled. And I think there's a real pleasure in that. Yeah. Um, and it's something that I think all of the artists in the show are playing with to some degree or another. Um, and it was something that I was happily thinking about on my own um, outside of the exhibition. So it was a definitely a fun assignment to be able to take a more creative approach um, to an exhibition text and think of it as an object as well. Thank you. Uh, um, can we do Q&A still or does it shut off? Very quickly, <laughs> yeah, sorry, it, this does not shut off. So thank you everyone. We're gonna keep continuing uh, just for a few more minutes. If you've stuck with us, please stay on for maybe another 10 to 15. Uh, I think we might as well take a very quick look at Megan's other piece and then 
Um, I do have some last uh, announcements and then we can do audience questions if everyone's okay with that. Uh, so Megan, if you wanna pull up your piece in the front. Sure. Um, and also why we're waiting for my computer to close this. I just realized that I haven't looked at the chat once this evening and there was quite a bit of um, action going on there. So I apologize if I've missed comments. Um, let's see here. Yeah, I'm not sure if some of these people are still with us, but but there was some. There we go. Okay. Yeah. We're back in full screen and we are scanning over here. Um, Cecilia, was there anything in particular you wanted me to address or do you just want me to do a brief kind of introduction of the this piece? Oh, I think you might be muted, Cecilia. There we go. I, I just wanted to make sure we didn't miss uh, one more piece in the show, so. Okay. Cecilia, Cecilia, actually you should talk because you've had to interact with this piece uh directly yeah i'm gonna i interacted with it today and i'm gonna interact again with it tomorrow as well as uh, the angels gate staff who are on site um yeah. we comment that we appreciate the lumbar support uh during <laughs> our staff meetings um but if you wanted to talk uh, just like for a minute about this piece sure um, so as Nathan mentioned in the initial kind of introduction of the show, we talked a lot about uh, addressing this conference space. It is a space that you have to walk through to, to view the rest of the exhibition. So it seemed like a really great opportunity to, um, to kind of insert you know, some artwork into it. And I've worked in galleries for many years and have been tormented by artworks that people put in into spaces with like looping soundtracks or um, like one time somebody had like a dog whistle in their work. So it was like this high pitched frequency. Um, and so I, I just wanted to make this kind of soft gesture. And um, my other piece was made with a flatbed scanner. So I think a lot about touch um, and the idea of like creating something that will like physically touch staff members. I mean, I didn't say that, that doesn't sound great, but like, just the idea of like intimacy with the people who work, I guess at Angel's Gate um, was interesting to me. And so I've made these 12 foot soft sculptures that are essentially arms wrapped around the chair. And like my ideal way to engage them would be like having a meeting and have something like wrapped around your shoulders or wrapped around your waist. Um, and then I couldn't help but think, you know, like in COVID times and where like human, touch is is like uh discouraged to have to get the opportunity i guess to just engage to kind of offer like an embrace seemed uh, exciting to me uh thank you um i'm going to go ahead and share my screen okay. um i just want to very quickly there was another comment there's one more piece that we didn't get to see uh some of the photos and that's uh Sam's other work in the show. Yeah, so that's um, a portrait, if you will, of the lower middle pane on that window um, replicated 50 times um, around the window. Uh, once again, it, it, simply just a something when I walked in that room, that window just spoke to me. It was really a beautiful, beautifully lit up like it is now. And um, this does show to be a kind of a exact moment in the day um, that it kind of has that view. Um, and then I, I, you know, thought, is there a way to kind of highlight that, but then also take this one pane and blow it up so many times that you kind of lose the window. Uh, that ended up not completely going to plan, but I was really happy with the outcome afterwards. So once again, one of those pieces where I think uh, learning to do 
installations uh, um, came out as a, a failure succeeded I, I, I feel good about that piece <laughs> so, but yeah also humorly um titled window pane window pane the lens yeah the lens well because you have to you have to think like how much of how much of the history of this place has that window seen and been through and and i think that that's really um that I really gravitate towards that architecturally with a building giving me something to to play with like that. So that was um, that's kind of where that started, and where and the outcome is what you see. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Sam. And I just want to do a, a quick thank you to uh, the curators Megan, Sam, and Nathan for bringing this group of artists together here at Angels Gate and putting on this excellent show. Um, it's our duty to show art and show artists and we love that we bring in guest curators because that brings in new perspectives into angels gate and uh, that better serves our community so thank you um, to the curators and artists for being here tonight um, i just want to do a quick um, announcement angels gate there's a lot going on and i'm just going to highlight the three next events but we have events going on through the end of the year Every third Saturday, we have a family art workshop. So we have one coming up on Saturday, the 21st. Um, B, if you want to hop on real quick and just say a quick hello and tell us about this next event that I have here on the screen. Um, hi, my name is B Correa. I'm the gallery management intern for from the Getty for this summer. Um, I'm facilitating an event um, on August 28th. Uh, it's a print screen printing workshop and I'm inviting one of my friends who is an artist from Whittier California he's been screen printing and selling his own products since 2018 and I invited him to Angels Gate to lead this workshop I think it's a great opportunity to bring somebody from my own hometown to Angels Gate as well as like invite other people to you know uh, participate in this workshop um there is limited um spacing so if you guys are interested you could always go to eventbrite and look up the event and just sign up for it and i did put the link for all these events to our um eventbrite profile in the chat so just click the chat it's at the bottom if you haven't opened it yet the link is there and then uh later this month we also have studio soup it's just three artists it's a quarterly installment and this next one we're really excited includes Henry Crusoe, uh, Tito Whitney Lick, and Floyd Strickland. So we are very excited about that event. And that, again, is called Studio Soup. And that's going to be on August 31st uh, of this month. And then I also wanted to let everyone know that uh, if you want to access the virtual tour that is posted and available online in our website, and I'm going to go ahead and put that link uh, in the ch chat for everyone as well. Uh, we have a whole virtual tour. Uh, we have uh, Hannah's uh, writing, uh, and there's also a link to make gallery appointments. So um, I hope everyone can make it out to the gallery. Currently, we do have gallery appointments. Of course, things keep changing, um, so that might change. So book your appointment soon uh, while we still have them. And hopefully, it'll stay that way through the end of the run, which is September 12th. Uh, September 11th and 12th is OPATH Other Places Art Fair from noon to 6 p.m. That is going to be, uh, hopefully, currently, that is scheduled to still take place on the Angels Gate uh, Cultural Center campus here in San Pedro. Please come to OPATH. Uh, come again to the closing uh, weekend of multiples. You'll get two awesome art experiences in one day, so please uh, come out for that. Uh, so now I think if anyone wants to sort of um, bring up their own questions to the artists, I did highlight some really great comments. So thank you. I know some people have already um, left the chat, but thank you for all of your questions and thoughtful comments. Um, I just kind of want to read a few. I, there was a really uh, nice comment about Megan's uh, piece upstairs. I appreciate the imperfections in this piece and how you offer them as a monument, the scars and wounds that are caused by the ones being upheld by the object that supports our walk. 
like how we endure our own scars and wounds as we support the others, the sacrifice for the ones we love. I know, Megan, you said you didn't read the comment, so I just thought it would be nice to hear that comment uh, from uh, Trend My Studio. So thank you. Um, you've made some really great comments and questions. Um, are there any other questions from the general audience to any of the artists? You can either put them directly in your chat, or if you're comfortable, you can pop up on screen. Hi, Henry. <laughs> um, I think there was another uh, great question, comment. Um, this one goes back to, um, I wonder if this person is still here for uh, Katya. Do you, do you see a relationship to Yayoi Kusama's early work and the pieces you are making? I'm also curious as, how you, as to how you select the colors of pantyhose that you use in your work. And that was from Carol Francis Lung. Hmm, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know which work they're referring to. Uh, I think that was just when we looked at um, the works upstairs in general. No, I guess I'm saying of, of, of Kusama. Oh, of Kusama. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't actually, but I really, I really love her work. I, I feel like, um, Actually, my big inspiration was uh, Ernesto Neto, if anybody wants to know that secret. <laughs> um, and in terms of choosing the colors, you know, I, it's funny, I vacillate between buying pre-packaged skin tone colors, and I really kind of like this idea of like buying like a nude or a suntan and, and using something that like exists in the world um, that I guess somebody or, or a corporation has like gone through the process of like deciding that that was the thing. And I like the idea of then subverting it into something that actually like does maybe look like, cause I don't think that pantyhose actually are very good at representing skin tones really. Um, and then actually, and then I also really like to buy whatever is like, um, or use whatever is kind of like in season or is like the trendy color palette as well. So I go be between really like light and, and um, soft colors and then super bright ones, depending on really like what I'm trying to talk about. But um, but obviously the skin tone ones are, you know, in my work that references the body. You dye the red ones or the, that's a natural? That's no, a color I, that I actually comes. don't dye them. I, I like the idea of purchase pre, you know, like having them predetermined. You know, it's cool. sort of, I guess, in a way, like the way that you, you know, you get the, the puzzles and they're already like predetermined, and then you have you have a way to interact with them. But there is like this other element that like I don't have control over, which I I sort of embrace. I do embrace. Yeah. No, I let so many people down when they found out I didn't make those images. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're, they're, too, I think they're too absurd, like, to, like, they do seem like you would have made them because they're so... But, but that's also, I think, the power is that, is, that, is that Sam is taking two things that are produced in the idea of, of the picturesque or the, or the sort of what's worth making a picture of or what's understood as a picture. And, the, and these are sort of understood enough about what makes a picture to produce to dedicate a factory to it. So a factory produces these things because they're so common, they're so understandable, even though they're absurd by his blending of them, they're clearly absurd. These like cats and the train and like the painting, yeah. like they're clearly ridiculous. In the same way, like a factory is dedicated to defining what human skin tone is or what color a woman's leg should be in the fall or something like that. You know what I mean? Right. Like it's like crazy red and you know these are all sort of like decisions that are made um, with the idea of selling us something, you know. And, and this whole apparatus has to get to it, you know. And the, if you were to custom produce these things, it would make the the decision on this stuff all to you, and it would be. But instead, you're pointing to the apparatus that exists outside of both of you, you know, who's deciding the imagery that that is quotidian enough to be produced as a puzzle, like who's deciding what color it is a, a body should wear or a body should be represented as, you know, outside of oneself, outside of the work. You, yeah. you, you as well, I feel like you, you know, like 
with the trees. They're like, I guess somebody somewhere. Somebody's like, idea of nature. Like, somebody's like, idea of like, what a tree should look like. Yeah. That like can be indoor trees, but like no what no like other types of trees. It's, they're like you know. Yeah. It's it's the same. It's the same kind of through line of who's deciding who's who's distilling it into this like funnel right right and and a hundred yeah exactly like these this tree and on its lonesome represents a sort of tree that exists is not controversial inside represents a product that can stand in for a tree is mass produced the whole apparatus spins up to produce these trees um it's not i didn't author it on my own and and i guess to talk about my work a little bit more, even you know, Sam has a has a puzzle piece that has a, a balloon race in it, and in this sort of original photo that only exists from my family is me at a, a hot air balloon race, which is sort of exists in the realm of the idea of the picturesque, which is this place where people go to take pictures. Like if you if there's a close up of my picture, my photo, there's there's a ton there's a ton of fathers and babies and cameras in that. The thing and so like everyone thought like let's go to the balloon race that's where you go to take pictures that's the idea of the picturesque like this is what we've received as images this is what we will reproduce in our action um, by bringing my baby to it and you know reproducing that thing and so there's that sort of circle about what's produced what's naturalized in terms of again get to skin color the things that the body wear or the images that one consumes as a sort of something as innocuous as a puzzle. Um, you receive images, you receive ideas of what's picturesque or what's normal. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all for the discussion and the comments. Uh, just two more really quick ones on uh, Katie's uh, tile two by fours. There was a comment, shadow as medium. I love how the shadows play into extending the object from line to shape. I really liked that comment. And then another one uh, for Seth, uh, there was a comment that Zion is a majestic place, but you've captured it in its humility somehow, which is I, I think it's interesting as most of the objects that you photograph are uh, humble objects. So just a couple more uh, comments that I wanted to take note of. Uh, again, thank you to everyone. Thank you to the artists and the curators. Thank you to uh, B, who's been running uh, tech in the background here. And then, of course, uh, there's a lot of people who made the show possible. Amy Erickson, our executive director, our preparators, uh, Sarah Pilchman, and also Carlos uh, Quevedo, who acts as a preparator, even though that's not his role. Um, and then we also have the staff who helped with uh, PR getting the word out. Uh, uh, Espada Amula, and then also Colleen Andrews, um, and then the virtual tour was made uh, uh, possible by Perry uh, Okamoto, um, who is a studio artist at Angel's Gate. So again, please visit. Uh, we do have appointments uh, Thursdays through Saturdays uh, from 10 to 4 p.m. Otherwise, thank you everyone uh, for joining us. If the artists uh, want to stay on for just a quick moment, uh, but thank you uh, for the guests who joined us um, tonight. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.